we move away from our limited visual perspective, we can easily realize that the Earth is one, certainly great, but at the same time unique unity. Our planet is in fact a global ecosystem that interacts in every part of it in a much more connected and complex way than surely we can get if we fix our gaze only on what surrounds us. We went to Huutiala, in the heart of Finland, where since 1910 there is a university center completely dedicated to one of the main resources of this nation, and not only, the forest. Every year, researchers from all over the world reach the foresty field station of the University of Helsinki to study the complex ecosystem that develops within the forests and in particular its interaction with the atmosphere. For many years, everyday data are collected that then become fundamental for the development of forecasting models. The flagship of this university center is the SMEAR-2 detection station. Active since 1995, it is one of the most elaborate avant-gardes in the world for monitoring a complex ecosystem. From the subsoil to the atmosphere that dominates the foliage, hundreds and hundreds of sensors and systems have been analyzing everyday variation of this coniferous forest for over 20 years. Most of the discussion is of course globally around the CO2. Okay, yeah. but, and, uh, and here we have, sorry, yeah. so just, just briefly, that, that here we have seen during this the existence of this station that the CO2 level goes up around 1 ppm annually. So we have started somewhere from, from uh, 380 and we are now near to 400. Recall that the CO2 limit for which the process of reconversion in oxygen activated by photosynthesis would become impossible by turning the air into an unbearable compound for us and for other living things is fixed in a concentration of carbon dioxide equal to 450 ppm. Many this kind of things that you really have to consider and when you when you start to model and predict uh, this this uh, uh, increase of the CO2 also causes this kind of CO2 fertilization, right. which, which makes it possible that actually the ecosystems are taking more CO2 also, so that uh, they are working more effectively to, to uh, act as a carbon sink due to the uh, increased CO2. Uh, do you have an idea what, what is happening in this kind of ecosystem? So, and, and if we of course, there's, or, there is interannual variation in the amount of, of needles and leaves. But if we refer from this year to the last year or this year to the next year, mid-July, there is not much variation. The amount of canopy is pretty much the same. Carbon is accumulating to the soil slowly. Since 10,000 years ago, there was no carbon. This was just bare soil after the ice age. So all the carbon has accumulated since, since the last 10,000 years. But the accumulation is so slow that if we try to measure it, if we take soil samples now, and then we take another set of soil samples after 10 years, the error of the sampling and the measurement is bigger than the change. So it's very slow. But what is happening is that the tree stems are growing. And they are in this stand, they are growing nearly 10 cubics per hectare per year at the moment. Which means that there will be produced about 5,000 kilograms of dry weight. A little less than 5,000 annually. Around 50% of that dry wake is carbon. Mm. So little over 2000 kilograms of carbon is annually accumulated to the tree stems. And that is quite typical carbon balance of the of the finished growing forest stand. 
But there is another process that has been studied and proven scientifically by SMEAR2 and concerns the ability of forest systems to create organic molecules that guarantee the water vapor present in the atmosphere to condense in the clouds that will then guarantee the rain. This area is dedicated to the study of aerosol particles formed in the undergrowth. Typically, we are now in, in a very clean air, air here. We typically have 1,000 little aerosol particles in one cubic centimeter. So 1,000 particles, one cubic centimeter. They are very small, and that kind of small particles are so reactive that we know that they cannot... It's not possible that they have traveled long distances. But they have some... They have to originate from this forest, from this area. And then these little particles start to grow and they start to form bigger and bigger and bigger particles. And when we measure this number of distribution, we see this phenomenon. But how are they formed? When the trees are, are, are photosynthesizing, they open their stomata, they take CO2 in, of course. But they are also emitting many types of, of uh, volatile carbon compounds, volatile organic compounds. And this, you can, you know all the smell of resin, for example, in the, in the forest. And when these volatile organic compounds, they oxidize in the atmosphere due to the sulfuric acid and some other compounds, they start to form bigger and bigger molecules and scatter to scatter. And in that, that, that's why they change from the gas phase to particle phase. And that, that phenomenon is called nuclease. And that is what is happening, and that, this has quite big importance. Since all the cloud nuclei, all the water droplets, <coughs> they are never just water. There's always some nuclei inside the water droplet, some particle in, inside the cloud nuclei, over which the water condensates and then can form clouds and water droplets. So this phenomena, this aerosol formation in forest, it enhances the formation of clouds and, and, the, and the raininess. Does this mean that we should plant more forest in dry areas of the world? Probably that they would, they do. would enhance the, the raininess. The studies elaborated and published with the data collected by SMEAR2 Station have made it possible to highlight them. Most of the clouds on our continent have been created by processes that originate in the ecosystem of forests. The interconnection between processes of accidental deforestation in the case of fires are wanted with the processes of urbanization, or cultivation and desertification that affect so much the vital economies of almost all the countries of the world have found here in Huutiala an easily comprehensible scientific explanation to everyone. In the forestry field station in Huutiala, the forest is studied and monitored also to have more tools and techniques, planting, insemination, study and protection from diseases, for the protection of a national value that is clearly perceived not only in its environmental dimension, but also economic. In fact, in Finland only 9% of the area is dedicated to traditional agriculture, while over 65% of the area is covered by forest. Almost 60% of this belongs to agricultural entrepreneurs, almost 400,000, who derive their profit margins from their forest resources. The wood industry in this country is one of the pillars of the GDP, surpassed only by the electro-technical industry. It covers over 20% of exports and is one of the main sources of population employment, especially in rural areas. Wood, paper and cellulose pulp are the main derivatives of this activity. But how did this country maintain such an important value over time? A key role was played by the state and the forest owners' organizations that managed to mediate the 
economic interest with the environmental one, transforming the needs into a single dynamic ecosystem. Since the introduction of the first Forest Act in 1886 which forbade the destruction of the forest, to the foundation of the first association representing the owners of the woods in 1906 that they could not face the downward pressure on prices of the timber industry individually. Finland now has over 300 associations and 80 entities specifically dedicated to the protection of forest management that cover the whole nation, with almost a thousand experts in services for sustainable forest management. At national level, all the associations, over 300,000 members, are represented by the MTK, the Union of Farmers and Forest Owners, whose task is not only to represent the interests of the associated categories, but also those of entrepreneurs, connected to the wood supply chain and the population of rural areas. For 50 years ago, there was some more a question about that there were the political parties. Uh, for instance, one part was very uh, much based on, on farmers and, 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 and has a very great support among the farmers. But nowadays we can say that all of those parties have to get their support from urban areas because population is concentrated on those areas and the voters are here, not in the countryside. And in that sense it has uh, led us to the situation where, where we have to take care of let's say, all of those issues which are important for the people in the countryside. Not only agriculture, not only forestry, but also, uh, let's say, uh, traffic policy uh, and, and these kind of services which are, which are provided for, for the people living in the countryside. And that has, in that sense, spread our, our work and, and, and has given a lot of more work to us. The lobbying system that has emerged, with pressures both nationally and internationally, has meant that over the years not only has the economic performance of the Finnish forests increased, the per capita income of owners in 2012 amounted to about €35,000 a year, but managed to increase the volume of the national forest heritage at the same time, consolidating economic and environmental revenues also for future generations.